Hello and welcome to this month's webinar on progressive set functions. This is Adam Brzezewski speaking, filling in for Richard Park due to uh, certain circumstances at the moment. Today's lesson is on um, assigning resources uh, to available slots. Uh, it is based on a traditional idiomatic expression used by APLs for decades. Um, there was a paper published by Bob Smith a while back which went through and explained this uh, idiomatic expression. I also ran a chat lesson in the APL Orchard based on this and we have fashioned a Jupyter Notebook a tutorial for you that you can try uh, either by downloading it and running it or you can go to try a pill and run it from there don't worry these links will be made available to you at the end of the webinar and thereafter so let's start with the very basics the index of function or lookup dyadic iota just as a quick recap of what this very fundamental APL function does, um, it looks for the major cells in the major cells in the right argument, and then finds the first location of matching major cells in the left argument. So, for instance, on the right argument, we begin with the letter B, and every occurrence of a letter B in the right argument gets as its corresponding result the index of the first b in the left argument. So here we have a b in the second position in the left argument, so the result is 2 for all the b's. And as we progress, then we, we hit an a in the right argument, and a is at index 1 in the left argument, so all the a's are going to map like this. And finally we have a c which maps to the first C, and only C, in the left argument. What we're going to discuss here today is a variation over this theme. It is still index of, but this time it's index of without replacement. What this means is that rather than mapping all the occurrences of a specific cell in the right argument to the first occurrence in the left argument, we, so to say, use up the occurrences in the left argument. Let's show this with the example. We begin as before with the letter B, which matches the letter B in the left argument at position 2. That's our result for the B. We proceed then with an A, which we have at position 1. Now when we get to the second A, then the A at position 1 in the left argument has been used up um, and we can't, we can't use it again. Rather, we are going to proceed forward to the next A. So that's at position 3, and that's the result for this. Same thing goes for the B, which we can't use the first B that has been used up by the first occurrence of a B in the right argument, and we instead map it to the position of the second B. And so too for C, of, of course, when we get there, and the next A here maps to the last A, but when we hit an A that doesn't have a corresponding cell in the left argument, then we revert to the behavior of normal iota, where if it doesn't find something in the left argument, then it returns one beyond the largest index of the left argument. So here, even though there are A's, we are not using them. Rather, we map that to the position one beyond the end of the left argument. And then finally, we have C, of course. Another way to think of this is that we, we take all the cells that are identical and place them in series, and we can then treat each series separately. So here we have, in the left argument, all the A's have their increasing and, and uh, separate numbering system, A1, A2, and A3. The B's have their numbering system, B1 and B2, and so too in the right argument, we have first the B's here, so we have B1 and B2, and the A's have A1, A2, A3, and A4, and so on. Now, since all the elements are unique in each respective 
argument, this means that we have a one-to-one -one pairing up of cells from the right argument with cells from the left argument. And the result that we get here is exactly this index of without replacement that we were looking for. So we can describe this as a sort of labeling. And we're going to build up a system for generating generic labels for any data so that we can apply the uh, dyadic iota and get the result that we want. Because in fact, the actual values that we're dealing with is not important for the result. The only thing we are interested in is which cells match which cells. So without further ado, let's start on this labeling. One way to generate a generic identification, we could say, for the cells in an array is with the what we could call iota selfie, or looking up the cells in the array itself. So here, for for the first element uh, being A in the left argument, then we find the first position of this A. For the second A, it also maps to that first A. And the third A maps to the, f the first A. The Bs all map to this, the first B. And the C maps, of course, to itself. So this is a way we could call the A's are element type 1. And the B's constitute element type 2, or series 2. And the C is number 4. These are not consecutive integers, of course, because they just go by the position of the first occurrence. But they're still useful to indicate which series a cell belongs to in a generic fashion. Same thing, of course, for the right argument. Uh, but here we begin with B first, and B uh, then gets the label 1 for this series. So the Bs get this. And A, instead, being that it occurs second, all the As become series 2. And C is then, of course, in this position. Now, in order to normalize this, so we have consecutive integers, we can apply the ranking function. So th there is no actual function called the ranking function in APL. Rather, um, it is constructed by applying the grade function twice. Now, the grade function is by itself, and it gives you the indices that if used to pick out cells from an array, would sort this in a particular order, whether ascending or descending, in this case ascending. The ranking function, which is the grade of the grade, gives you a generic array, which is a vector of indices, which would sort identically to the original array. So that means that the grade of the original array, in this case L iota L, is the same thing as the grade of the ranking function applied to this. And that means we have now a generic labeling, no matter what the actual data is, of consecutive integers going up. So here we can see that A is number 1, and B is number 2, 2 here, and C is number 4. And by grading them, and then grading again to get the rank, um, we can see that we are placing the A's together. So A becomes number 1 and number 2, and, they, and number 3. And then comes all the B's, number 4 and number 5. And finally, we have the C's. So in a way, this is these elements have been grouped into a, an order. And that takes us almost to the end, actually. But we still have some adjustments to make, because this only works under certain circumstances. So here's what we've got so far. We've got the ranking applied to the self-indexing for the left argument and for the right argument. We can see here that A is has positions 1 and 2 and 3, and so too in the right argument, A has position 1 and 2 and 3. B has positions 4 and 5. So 2 in the right argument, 4 and 5, and C has position 6. So now, since we're dealing with a permutation vector, all the elements are unique, and we then have a one-to-one -one mapping using IOTA. Well, this means that IOTA is going to give us the same result um, as if it we had this 
ready-made function of the progressive uh, iota. And then we can see here that we're getting the result that, that we're looking for, um, that the first A here maps to in the first position over here, the second A maps to position 3, the third A maps to position 6, the B maps to position uh, 2, and the C, so on. However, as I mentioned, this only works under circum certain circumstances. One is that the arrays have to have the same unique cells. If they aren't the same, the same set of cells, though in a different order, then we're going to get labeling that doesn't match. So here, in our example, we have um, A being assigned the first label 1 in the left argument, but P in the right argument gets assigned level uh, series 1. So that doesn't work. Secondly, there has to be equally many of each element. If that isn't the case, then the labeling, which is consecutive in integers, gets out of sync. So here in this example, A, B, A, C, with A, B, A, B, and we can see that as long as they're the same number of elements, it's fine. A and A gets 1 and 2 and 2. Um, but then in the Bs, the first two Bs are the same. That works. But now that we're out of sync, C gets mapped with a B, which is, of course, not right. Same. Th the last thing is that the unique major cells um, have to appear in the same order. And the reason for this is that we don't actually care what the values are. Rather, we we care about these generic labels we're getting giving them. And since we're giving them generic labels, then we just start with the first occurring element. I have been advised that we have a, are having problems with our um, online chat on the video channel. Um, so if you want, you can, and if you're able to, you can proceed over to the APL Orchard and Richard Park, who is with me there, um, will make sure to redirect any comments that you have to, through to me from the APL Orchard chat room. So proceeding with this, with all these with all these um, requirements fulfilled, then our system will work. But if any one of them are is not uh, there, then things will not match up. Let's see what we can do to get rid of these requirements so that we can apply this to the general case. Here is um, what we have been doing so far. We're looking up the left argument in itself and the right argument in itself. And since our arrays match all these criteria, we get the right result. The problem here, of course, with the last requirement, which was that they have to appear in the same order, is that we're looking up the elements in order to generate labels in different orders, in different lookup arrays. For the left argument, we're looking up in the left argument. And for the right argument, we're looking up in the right argument. However, we're not actually interested in whether things exist in the right argument or not. We're only interested in a lookup in the left argument. So if instead we use the left argument consistently as lookup array, then it doesn't matter which order things appear in, because they will always be looking up in the same array that has the same order, the order of the left argument being the left argument. So this takes care of this problem. Second problem after that is that the arrays must have equally many of each cell. Now, how can we fix this? Well, we're looking at the left argument, we're looking at the right argument, and they might not match each other. But the multiset union, which is just the concatenation of the major cells of the left argument and the right argument, as long as we are doing a permutation of that, then, of course, the number of the total number of every conceivable type of cell, anything that comes from either the left or the right argument, or both of them, will have the same number. 
and we still have lookup in the left array as the lookup array and therefore the ordering will be the same. However, of course, for the right argument, we're actually interested in the cells of the right argument, so we place those first. Whereas in the left argument, we're interested in the cells of the left argument, and we're placing those first. So here we can see that we are almost there with the result we wanted. Of course, we're getting too many results, because we are looking at the multiset union but if we restrict this to the number of cells in the right argument, so that corresponds to this lookup of the just the right argument cells, then we've got exactly the number we want. The only thing missing now is that we're getting numbers that are too high in the left argument. And this is, of course, because we are generating a too big lookup array on the left. Anything that doesn't appear in the first elements of this lookup array, which corresponds to the left argument's cells, is something that's beyond the edge and should just be mapped generically to the index one above the last index. And we can do this by simply restricting the length of the left lookup array to the length of the left argument. And that gives us the result that we've been looking for all along. So, to recap this, we're going to match up all these elements by looking up in a generic array in their orders and anything that doesn't, that doesn't find its match from the right argument to the left argument is going to be mapped to the indicator of n not being there for IOTA, which is one beyond the last index. Index of is not the only function though that we can do this without replacement modification of. There's another set function, which is the membership function. And that one can also be made in a similar manner by simply defining it in terms of the index. Why is this? Because membership is actually a bit more lossy when it comes to the data. IOTA, it tells you where something was found. Epsilon only tells you whether it was found. So in other words, if we can take the indicator that we get out of IOTA saying that something was missing, that's enough for us to determine whether it was a member or not. And so what is this indi indicator? Being beyond the length. So now we know if the index we find is less than or equal to the length, then it's a member. And if not, then it's not a member. So if we define it like this, then we have for free epsilon defined in types in terms of iota. Now there is a little bit more to to say about this, um, but we will return to this with a follow-up videos in the future. Here they are together: uh, the dyadic epsilon function and the dyadic iota function, um, wrapped so that they are progressive. And you might notice a pattern here. The code here is very similar. Firstly, we have IOTA instead of Epsilon, Epsilon instead of IOTA, and the rest of the code around them is really the same. You might also notice that we have swapped the left argument and the right argument from the two. And this is because IOTA and Epsilon treat their arguments in a slightly different manner. IOTA has as its left argument the lookup array. That is, we are looking up in the left argument for the positions of the right argument elements. However, epsilon takes as its lookup array its right argument, and it looks for elements of the left argument and whether they exist in the right argument. So we need to swap the arguments here based on this definition. Since we have this very clear pattern here, where it's really just um, an iota or an epsilon, which makes the iota epsilon, in a sense, a parameter for, the for this function application, this lends itself really nicely to an APL operator. So we can define an operator, we can call it without replacement, and then we can use it like this, iota without replacement and epsilon without replacement. You might ask, what is this good for? 
I mentioned theoretically assigning resources with slots availability. Here's a practical example from the real world. Let's say that we have some passenger type, uh, seat types in an airplane. First class, business class, premium economy, economy. And then we have a bunch of people who are interested in buying tickets. However, there's a limited capacity for each type of seat in the plane. Which seats will be filled? And this we can answer by pairing up corresponding elements. First class passenger wants to go in the first class seat. First class passenger goes in the first class seat. Premium passenger goes in a premium seat, and so on. And since we can't seat multiple uh, multiple passengers in the same seat without serious consequences, at least, um, we have to use a progressive lookup instead of just a plain lookup. And this indeed we can do. Here we are seating a passenger at the seats where there is availability without replacement in the right argument. This and we're doing that with the passengers here. And we can go further with this. We can count the number of passengers and then we can say ask how many passengers got a seat. Because we get a boolean for indicating which ones were members, meaning which ones had slots. Then if we sum that boolean vector, that gives us the number of passengers that were seated. And we can use this further to compute uh, the load on the f on the plane, fuel requirements, fees, and so on. So these functions actually have some very real real-world applications. Uh, they could also be used to distribute medicine based on triage and who needs it more, hospital beds, ventilators, and so on. There are many applications, especially in these trying times. Here it is all together. Uh, we have the without replacement operator and you can define your progressive dyadic iota function in terms of that. You can define your progressive dyadic epsilon in terms of this. And that's really all there is to it. Um, as I promised, here are the links again. And we'll see you again in a month for the next webinar. Thank you so much for watching.